ask for drink. Jacob, what are you drinking today? Uh, coffee. What kind of coffee? Uh, just standard coffee, not okay. not super milligram coffee, but not not blueberry. No blueberry. <laughs> no blueberry. No. <laughs> <laughs> good morning, Dr. Brasher. How are you? Good morning, Dr. Decker. I'm good. Can you hear me all right? We can hear you just fine. What are you drinking this morning? I'm drinking water. I'm trying to stay. Oh, living on the oh. edge. <laughs> That's I tried important. to coordinate Very dangerous. my mug. <laughs> <Yes>. <laughs> I, my water's empty, so I should probably fix that, but I didn't. <laughs> Instead, I'm belly up to the coffee bar here. So Listen, I went to my group fitness class last night, and they worked me over. They wore me out, so I'm still recovering. <laughs> the water's probably the best thing. The yeah. students were talking about Death Wish coffee. It's like some super high caffeinated coffee that, we're, oh, that they're goodness. not letting me have. <laughs> For oh, good reason. For good before. reason. <laughs> it's 300 let me grab my bag so you guys can at least have a visual just a second all right good morning Corey. hello what are you drinking Corey? uh water but i was considering making coffee <laughs> oh go for it makes coffee it's only 10 54 you got time i mean seriously i mean not like my you're second one of the day I, did, I didn't mean it like that oh oh wait oh so put the picture closer let's put the little skull and crossbones is kind of cute Ooh. Oh, I like that. I do admit when I drink it and I have my pirate shirts on, I do feel like a real pirate, especially when I have sea shanties going on in the background. But um, yeah, and in the back, it says warning world's strongest coffee. Oh my gosh, that's insane. <laughs> well, I used to work at a that. coffee shop and I don't think you've heard my stories, but they used to have let me have unlimited coffee. Oh, so I would. I would have three large iced lattes with about five shots of espresso in each one, all in the span of my four-hour shift. Oh, my God. And this is after I got out of <laughs> yes, high school where I, I was like, this. oh, I'm like this all the time. <laughs> That's crazy. <laughs> We're talking about uh, coffee. Dr. Brasher, I did my best to coordinate my coffee mug with your lecture today. I am very excited. Oh, free, is that Frida Kahlo? It is, yes. Very, that's amazing. You did a nice job, really. It's colorful it too. That, it was that or my Costa Rica mug, so I had to make a choice. <laughs> so let's see, Corey, did you decide to make the coffee? Uh, yeah, I'll probably do it um, after class. That way, I don't miss anything. <laughs> probably a good thing. I'm like, oh, go make some coffee. You got time. Probably not the best idea, but anyway. Can you remind me, Dr. Decker, about how many students you normally have in the class? Uh, tw tw 23. We have 20. So I teach at RIT and they like to give me prime numbers so that we can't do any group work, but we're divided into two sections. So that makes it awesome because we have an 11 and a 12. So there's oh. that. Um, yeah. So we'll be, okay. we'll be assembling in here shortly. We normally don't meet on Zoom. So normally we're in person. So there's usually, um, we've met on Zoom for our guest speakers and I think one other time. So yeah, we're normally in class with one another. Were both sections that. of the course invited to join today? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yep. So we have oh, a Tuesday yeah, section okay. and a Thursday section. So they'll be, they'll be together. So our Thursday people might not remember <laughs> that they're, they have to be on Zoom today. So it, we'll, we'll see how gotcha. that goes. So let's see. Good All morning, right. Megan. What are you drinking? Let's see what Megan's drinking. Maybe. It's so funny. This is always how we start our calls. <laughs> it's like I have to know what I have to know what people have for their beverage of choice. Um, I do have sad news though, if we want to slightly deviate the topic. Oh, go for it. I've had my kettle, my electric kettle, since like 2018 when I started my freshman year of college. It's yes. it broke. It took me like 13 tries to get it to stay on this morning. So Ben is currently buying a new kettle. Oh, that means you need to graduate, Coda. <laughs> Yeah, the kettle is broken. You need to graduate. Darn. Less than a month now. <laughs> That's so exciting. So, Dr. Brasher, where are you all in your semester right now? Uh, how far along are you? How many weeks do you have left? We are starting. This is week thirteen for us. So we basically have two more. <gasps> a same baby. Here. Week 13, yeah. We have two weeks left. Yep. Same here. Yep. So, <laughs> um, which means on our last so. Dr. Brescher, we have this situation where like sometimes days that are on the calendar aren't really what they are. So our, our Monday, May 3rd is actually a Thursday. 
oh. <laughs> at RIT, right? So we have this week, which is us on Zoom with you, yay. Next week is like traditional week. And then the last week of the semester, we meet on Monday and Tuesday <laughs> instead of Tuesday and Thursday. So yeah, nothing like giving us a little bit of a challenge, but there it is. Right. So let's see. Nothing um, like messing up your routine and your schedule, you know? I know, yeah. I know. It's like you finally get used to it. And then it's like, ah, ah, screwed yeah. it up, screwed it up. Good what morning, everyone. Are you at? Oh yeah, go ahead, go ahead. Which city? I'm in Columbus, Georgia at Columbus State University. Nice. Good morning, like Georgia. everyone. So I'm just welcoming everyone in. So as you're, as you're populating and make sure you have something to drink um, and we'll get started here. It's 10.59, we'll get started in another minute or two. I'm gonna do a couple of announcements and then I'll turn things over to Dr. Brasher, so. So Dr. Brescher, we're going to get snow tonight. What about you? <laughs> yeah, we don't get snow this far south very often. Once or twice a year, maybe. Definitely yeah. not today. It feels amazing. I'm wearing shorts. Yeah. Yeah, I walked over to mail a letter this morning and uh, it was, it's in the 40s. It's pretty chilly. I'm originally from Atlanta, so I do have the, oh. blood, of the, the blood of the south, as it were. I'm used to warm weather, I should say. <laughs> I should say it that way. Um, That's right. I but, remember you mentioning that. Yeah. Yeah. So this is a little, this is a, I've moved up and down, north and south, flip up back and forth. I did my PhD mm -hmm. at Case Western and then went down to Kentucky and then back up north. So mm -hmm. it's like, ah. It's kind I of miss Georgia. I'm originally weather. from Tennessee and uh, I didn't think it would be that different between Tennessee and Georgia, but I'm so much further south yeah. now that the summers are just infinitely more brutal and humid than they were in Tennessee. And I thought it was yeah. bad there. Yeah, yeah. Humid is the is the key. And people say, oh, you you like the heat. Yeah, I like the heat, but not the humid. So hot Atlanta or Atlanta. Yeah, that's a lot. And but I would take 115 degrees and dry of Grand Canyon any day over humidity in the in the 80s. And people up here say, Oh, it's so humid. I'm like, <laughs> Please. Go to Atlanta in the oh, summer no. or Columbia, South Carolina, then you'll know humid. Oh, you'll, know. you'll know what humidity is in one of those places. Okay, looks like we have most everybody here. So I think we could probably go ahead and get started. So um, good morning, everyone. So it's a little bit after, it's 11.01 right now. So um, today's class today, or today's class for History 322. So we're all together. So you probably see on the participants or in your um, gallery view, you probably see some friends from the other section that you haven't seen for a while. So that's great. So we're coming all together for our guest lecture today with Dr. Jordan Brasher. So he's gonna start in just a minute. I'm recording this for anyone who can't be here. I think there's one student who can't be here. So I'll post that link after today so that you have access to it as well. A um, couple of announcements. So um, first of all, I'm going to try and share my screen. Let's see how this works out. Um, give me one second here. A uh, couple of fun announcements, uh, two things. So many of you know, I am the advisor for Color Me Calm, which is our coloring club at RIT. So we have two events this week. One of them is tonight and the table's are already set up. I went and checked on that. So it's going to be quite chilly, but if you wanna do some tie dye, fun times tonight, they're doing uh, tie dye masks for $2. And then later this week, the second, stellar Bob Ross paint night. So um, these are, I think they're in the, my courses. If they're not, I'll check and make sure. Um, so that's this week. So just a couple of announcements. If you need something to sort of calm yourself, Color Me Calm is the coloring club and they invite you to join them this week, tonight and later this week. A couple of other things slightly um, more course content related. Um, one of them is for your final slides. So I posted this to my courses yesterday. It's, it's trying to open, we'll see. So um, there's not a handout for this assignment, like an actual handout like we've had with all of our other assignments. So I'll talk about this when we're back together in class next week. It's due in two weeks on uh, May 3rd. That's the Monday, that's really a Thursday. Um, and so what you're doing is just like we did for our first PowerPoint, but you're going through all of the things that we did this semester. So your essay, um, that part, don't worry about site visit, but your essay, your state research, 
your proposed monument, all of the things that we did this semester. So you're actually going through and creating a PowerPoint about each thread of the research that you've done. And we'll present those together um, on our last two days of class. So that will function as kind of like our last days together. And then the other, what we're looking at um, today is Dr. Brasher's work, and we have the article, and then there was a link to an interactive that's in the my courses, so we'll turn our attention to that. Um, the only other announcement I have is that I have completed the grading for all of the assignments, particularly the project that was the one that was taking me the longest to um, evaluate. So for context, Dr. Brasher, the students were going through, they each chose a state, and then they identified 25 monuments and memorials in that state, and we're building a database um, of monuments and memorials in the US. So each student adopted the state and then came up with this sort of sense of that state's identity through that sort of very brief sample selection that they did. And then they've been populating it to the database and, and doing other things with that data. And then they just turned in some visualizations using Tableau. They just turned those in yesterday. Um, so for, if you go- Excellent, the, I love that. Sorry, I don't wanna cut you up. I'll say no, more no, about no. that in a second. No, no, that's fine, that's fine. Um, and so for the students, so go through your my courses and look at all of the grades that have been deposited. Everything that you've turned in should have a grade accounted for it. If you're Joe, I might have screwed up your grades. Hi, Joe. Sorry about that. Um, and like put a zero in something where there was a, actually a comment. So, so if there's a question, feel free to ask me about that because obviously I do make mistakes, but also just in case you have questions. So each of those has the feedback like normal. So just look for that. And then if you have a question, shoot me an email. We can hop on Zoom or you can catch up with me next week. Um, I think that's everything. Code, is there anything else I need to talk about or anything else I need to um, mention? I feel like there is, but I have the memory of a squirrel, so I cannot remember for the life of me what it is. I'll make a note and then I'll, I'll say it at the end. Um, and then throughout the presentation, Dr. Brasher, do you mind if students put things in chat for questions to take later? Like if they're thinking of it right now, they could put it in chat and then we could just go through the chat at the end if there are any questions, is that okay with you? Yeah, that works. That's great. Perfect. Mm -hmm. Perfect. Okay. So with without further ado, I'll turn things over to Dr. Jordan Brasher, who is at Columbus State University, and he teaches in the geography department. And so I invited him to join us today to give us a sense of an intersection of what we've been talking about in our course in terms of representation and identity. And we've just sort of touched on just last week with Jeb Stewart and the piece by Katahinda Wiley called Rumors of War. We spent some time talking about appropriation and we spent some time thinking through like the borrowing of an image or the borrowing of an idea and then kind of tweaking it and juxtaposing it and giving it new meaning. And then we looked at the example from Karen Olivier in Kentucky with the mural that we talked about last week. So we we're talking about appropriation and we've kind of turned the corner for these last few weeks thinking through what place monuments and memorials have today. You know, there's the take everything down, there's the leave everything up, there's the heritage, hate, there's all these debates and discussions. And we're sort of working through that with the readings that we've been doing. So I invited Dr. Brasher to join us today because A, he has really compelling research that I think would be of interest for us. But also in terms of intersection with our course, on the surface, you might look at and say, well, this is in Brazil and this has nothing to do with us. But actually, meaning us and our course, which is focused on the US. But actually, there are a lot of intersections that I think we can sort of peel back and think about our course content as being illuminated by what he's going to share today. So I'll turn things over to him right now. It's 1107, he'll, he'll do some slides. He's, he's welcome to talk about anything he wants in the beginning. So if you wanna talk about Tableau and how much you love it or hate it, Dr. Brasher, we would gladly see that. And then he's gonna do some slides and then we'll open up for questions and we'll kind of go from there. So um, I think we're ready and we'll turn it over to you. All right, can you guys hear me all right? Coda, thumbs up if you can hear me. Great, awesome. So uh, yeah, I was super excited to hear about your coloring club, about uh, using Tableau. I mean, th this, is, this is really exciting. Um, and oh, and also your project seems really interesting as well that you guys are working on. Um, I, I love the idea of like 
developing a new monument or adopting a state and you know talking about the monuments that are present in that state in fact as a as a geographer um you know we are always really interested in data visualization with things like tableau and with you know looking at the role of place in the commemorative landscape um so i'm really i'm really glad that it seems like you're crossing a lot of disciplinary boundaries with the uh, the way you're approaching monuments in memory as someone who is actually in a, a history and geography department together. It's a joint department uh, that has seven historians and three geographers. Uh, I feel like I'm always fighting for the relevance of geography to understanding the past because historians like to think that sometimes they have a monopoly on understanding the past. Uh, but those of us in geography certainly uh, have our ways of thinking about it as well, especially sensitivity to place and landscape and sort of the wider social, spatial, political context surrounding monuments, uh, which I think sometimes gets a little bit lost in the discussion. Um, I'm going to come back to my title slide in just a second, but I want to show you something else by way of introducing myself. Um, I have a series of maps here that I made just this morning, not in Tableau, but in a program called ArcGIS Online. Um, I don't know if any of you have familiarity with it, but um, most universities that teach geography and geographic information systems have um, a license with Esri, the company that produces GIS uh, or this particular GIS software. Um, there are other open source ones that are not um, sort of corporate proprietary software programs, but this one is proprietary. Um, I just wanted to show you this. I made these maps this morning in the class that I was teaching in my intro to GIS class um, because I found some really interesting data. Speaking of sort of developing a database of monuments, there is a, a, a data source that might be of interest to some of you who are working on that type of project at the uh, Southern Poverty Law Center website. Perhaps you already know about it. Um, and they keep a running updated spreadsheet. So I downloaded the data this morning. It was just updated this morning. So this is hot off the press, new up-to-date, um, high quality data. And I wanted to just show you uh, some visualizations that I did. Uh, this map shows all of the remaining Confederate monuments in the, um, in the United States. And there are about 687 of them. I wanted to show that in part because I've been hearing a lot of reporting around this data that suggests that there are about 1700 Confederate monuments, but that's actually not true. There are about 1700 Confederate symbols in public space that include things like parks, street names, bodies of water, um, in total about 1700, but just physical sort of concrete monuments is around 687. Uh, these are the ones that have been removed, mostly since 2015, uh, since the, uh, the unfortunate Charleston massacre at that time, which really sort of, of course, as you guys probably have talked about, reinvigorated a lot of public debate around this issue. Uh, so around 146 physical monuments have been removed. Of course, there are other cases of you know, street names being renamed and schools being renamed and things of that nature. One of the interesting things you can do with GIS is something called a density analysis. So you can look at where are these monuments clustered closely together? Where are sort of the, the major sites of Confederate um, monument presence on the landscape? And of those monuments that are still in existence, some of the major sites, as you can see from this density analysis, include sort of that belt area from Atlanta to Columbia, South Carolina. Um, there are a, really a lot of them in that region. And then also Richmond is, of course, a major, uh, a major area with its Monument Avenue um, there as well. So the, this is a density analysis that shows you those clusters of monuments that still exist today. Think of it like a topographic map, except instead of measuring elevation, you're measuring the amount of Confederate monuments sort of clustered together spatially, right? Um, so the darker color there is the, the denser cluster or the you know, increased density. And then this is a density analysis of um, actually those that have been removed in the last, mostly in the last five years, but a few before that as well. And so you can see really the locus of a lot of the activism and removal, I guess we should say the successful removal of places from the land, uh, of monuments from the landscape has been in the Richmond, Virginia area. And in fact, several um, along the Monument Avenue corridor have been removed. So um, this is something that, you know, that we 
do in geography to sort of integrate our some of our interests with understanding the past, also understanding how the past influences the present in terms of memory and data visualization and place and landscape. So I just wanted to show um, some of these maps that I created this morning by way of kind of fighting for uh, the legitimacy of geography in terms of understanding some of these issues and also to sort of introduce you to a little bit of my disciplinary background. Um, I have a PhD in geography from the University of Tennessee, which I received last year. And uh, like I said before, I'm a, a first year assistant professor of geography and GIS at Columbus State University. Okay. So um, that is a little bit about me. I will return to my title slide and we can go ahead and get started with my presentation. Does anybody have a question or comment they'd like to share before we get started? I'll just add in, Dr. Brasher, maybe at the end, some of the students can talk about their projects and their states and what they found from their team. Awesome. I, I think what you just did was really helpful to illuminate sort of your approach. So that would be really great. So thank you for that. Yeah, that sounds great. And like I said, even if you don't have access to ArcGIS online, you know, there are other open source um, programs like QGIS. Uh oh, sorry, I was just hearing someone in the background. Was that talking over someone? Okay, great. Okay, so let's get started. Um, sorry, my slides are not looking, they're not looking great. Let me see if I can reopen this really quickly. And I'll just add that we do have ArcGIS. We have a site license here at RIT. So some of you may have used that in a course or two. So I see a couple people shaking their heads. So, um, and, and it is a really, really useful tool for a lot of different applications. So you might think of it as being based in geography, um, but, but we use it across campus and other um, fields too. So. Awesome, I love that. It's so, also just fun to learn how to use. It's a cool skill you can add to your resume. Who's the senior in the group? We got code as a senior, other seniors adding skills to those resumes. <laughs> <laughs> okay, hopefully that looks a little bit better on the screen. I don't know what's going on with my PowerPoint looked really nice before I downloaded it and now it looks funky, but anyways. Um, it looks fine. Jordan, it looks fine. I mean, we see, we can see like the main view and then we see like a little preview window off to the side. So I, it looks fine. Oh. So um, yeah, so it's okay. Okay, great. Yeah, no worries. I was hoping that you could only see that one, that one mm -hmm. slide. Maybe hit that little button, the little, <laughs> the little TV looking button. <laughs> Yeah. Zoom, Zoom has not made presenting easy. I have not found a way to have one screen and have presenter notes open and just the presentation. Oh, that's that's working. Uh, Jordan, we can't we can only see big Columbus State University, big creating Confederate pioneers. So if it's working on your end, it's working on ours. OK, can you see um, my name and the date in the bottom left corner yep. in the whole slide? OK, perfect. We got the whole slide. And, and trust me, we're a, we're a forgiving group. The students have seen me struggle okay. every single day. So, so this okay. is nothing new. In fact, you're looking quite elegant compared to my foibles. Well, so yeah. So I, re I really thought I had this down to a flawless science at this point after doing it for about a year, but there are always hangups, right? No, it looks great. So if you're ready, go ahead and roll. But, but we can okay. do it too. That's fine. Great. So thank you guys again for having me today. Thank you to Dr. Decker for the invitation. I'm really excited to be here with you this morning. Uh, and to talk to you a little bit about my dissertation research and uh, the year that I spent doing that research in Brazil. Um, as you can see from the title of my talk, I'm gonna be discussing with you today this idea of Confederate pioneers and some of the transnational racialized politics of remembering the Confederacy in the interior of Sao Paulo, Brazil. Little known is the fact that after the end of the US Civil War, several thousand former Confederates from the US South rather than face the reconstruction of the South after its devastation in the war and the possible incorporation of the formerly enslaved into Southern life and politics, decided to pack their bags and head for Brazil. In my opening slide, you can see images from the 2019 Festa Confederada, which means Confederate Festival, where Confederate descendants continue to celebrate their heritage today annually, um, but not without protest and controversy, especially recently. 
What I'd like to do today is to try to make some sense of the memory of the Confederate settlers who migrated to Brazil within frameworks like settler colonialism, global critical race theory, and critical memory studies. Okay. So here's where we're going and how we'll get there. I'll start by providing a brief introduction to the study sites, especially um, the festival that I just showed you and also a museum, which you hopefully read about for today. I'll overview a little bit of the history of the Confederate migration from the US South to Brazil. And again, these are migrants from the former slaveholding Republic of the US South who fled their homeland to Brazil after the US Civil War. I'll outline some key theoretical frameworks that inform my thinking about Confederate memory in Brazil, and I'll describe the methods I used in my dissertation to carry out this work. I use a mixed methods approach involving things like ethnographic methods, semi-structured interviews, um, and spatial narrative analysis, which you read a little bit about in my article in the Journal of Heritage Tourism, uh, which is sort of like discourse analysis, but with a close attention to sort of the spatial design elements of the museum. Okay, and I'll overview some key research questions and findings and then conclude by describing some of the broader impacts of this research uh, that I hope it has and for whom it matters. So again, as a geographer, I cannot resist showing maps as often as possible and where possible, where it's helpful. So here's a map of some of the places where Confederates settled in Brazil in the aftermath of the US Civil War. I created this map according to data that I compiled from a book called Soldado Descanso, which means soldier rest, uh, which is written in Portuguese by Brazilian Confederate descendant Judith McKnight Jones and published in 2015. This map is likely not an, a comprehensive list of all the places where Confederates settled in Brazil, but it gives some idea of the distribution of those settlements. It's worth noting that in addition to settlements in Brazil, Confederates also settled in countries like Mexico, Cuba, Honduras, Peru, Chile, and Venezuela. Overall, few Confederate settlements survive for very long or today retain traces of Confederate settlement in the cultural landscape. Things like disease and economic hardship befell many of these original settlers who either dispersed, migrated again to another place, or even returned home uh, to the United States. But you can sort of see there in the, um, the bottom right of the map, or I should say the south or southeastern part of Brazil, that the states of like Sao Paulo and Rio de Janeiro, which are much more populated than, than most of the rest of the country, you know, those it sort of makes sense that those that's where many of them landed. OK. Of those settlements which did last and those with the most noticeable traces of Confederate settlement remaining on the landscape today include the two pictured here and this more zoomed in map to the state of Sao Paulo, okay? Americana, which you can see listed there next to its sister city, Santa Barbara do Oeste, are two neighboring towns uh, that were founded originally by uh, Confederate settlers. Um, of course, we'll, we'll talk a little bit about sort of problematizing the narrative that they were originally founded by Confederate settlers, but um, I'll put it in those terms for now, okay? And the Americana name is pretty interesting because, um, you know, it reflects an historiographic issue actually with trying to understand how Confederates or how many Confederates migrated to Brazil. So census takers and record keepers often fail to distinguish whether the settlers were coming from Confederate or Union states in the aftermath of the Civil War and often lumped them together and just referred to them as Americans. The legacy of this today is that in my experience, residents of Americana that I spoke to and that participated in some of my research um, rarely had a frame of reference for who the confederados really were, which is the, the Portuguese name for the Confederate settlers who migrated there. And instead recalled them often as Norte Americanos or North Americans who migrated to Brazil. Nevertheless, these are the primary known surviving Confederate settlements. And again, the study sites where I carried out my research. And finally, a third map to introduce the study sites. This map is taken from my article in Focus on Geography, which um, Dr. Decker mentioned is posted hopefully in your learning management system. It's sort of a, a, a more digestible, um, shorter, and more interactive and dynamic article that, um, that explains some of the work that I did here around the Confederados and this, this commemorative project. Okay, as you can see, I've highlighted these two key study sites where the museum is located 
it's called the Museu da Imigração, uh, which means Museum of the Immigration, referring to the Confederate Immigration, and then also the Festa Confederada, the Confederate Festival. You can see the museum is sort of located in downtown Santa Barbara do Oeste, in the city, in the more urban part of the town, in the downtown plaza. And then the, the Confederate Festival is in a more rural location, it takes place about 20 to 30 minutes outside of town. And um, you actually have to take uh, sort of a dirt road to get there. It's, it's pretty remote. Okay. The Festa Confederada is an annual celebration of the culture of the antebellum South during an era in which chattel slavery defined its political economy. Although it might be hard to pick up on that just from attending the festival's activities. The festival, like the museum, is organized by Confederate descendants and the traditional music, dance, dress, and cuisine of the American South is celebrated, displayed, and performed for around 2,000 visitors each year in April. The festival has taken place since about 1980 with some intermittent cancellations due to weather conditions. And interestingly, in 2003, um, out of respect for and, and maybe even revolt over the American invasion of Iraq. And so there, uh, I always like to mention that because there was a, there's a news article I came across in the archives that um, the, the lead organizer of the, um, the folks who organized the festival, it's called the Fraternity of American Descendants. Um, she was quoted in a local news article as saying that we didn't feel like it was proper to have a festival celebrating uh, what they framed as American culture while the United States was invading Iraq in 2003. So um, on the one hand, you know, a lot of what you hear in the local news today, um, or, or if you talk to any of these organ festival organizers today is, oh, this is a benign sort of family event where, you know, we're just here to celebrate our ancestors. And yet, if you look throughout the history of the festival, there have been moments like in 2003, where it sort of took on more political, social political overtones um, and directly canceling the festival out of revolt against the U.S. invasion of Iraq. So um, I, I like to point that out. Okay, here's a photo of the museum where um, I did my research uh, for the, the piece in the Journal of Heritage Tourism. I made about a dozen site visits to the museum between September 2018 and June 2019. Uh, that's when I was living in, in Americana. And I often encountered school children as visitors and very, very few adults in my trips to the museum. I had originally planned to interview adult visitors, but there were so few that I, I couldn't really get a good sample size. So I decided to talk to the art educator for the museum and also the museum's manager um, for my interview data, okay? And the museum is housed in a, interestingly, in a, a former prison on the downtown square of Santa Barbara. Okay. This is also here a, a photo of the festival, the Festa Confederada that I took in April 2019. Um, notice that the large stage is emblazoned with the Confederate symbol where the events are taking place. And the upper left portion of the photo is a protruding obelisk, a Confederate monument, commemorating the original Confederate settler families with their engraved last names surrounding the base of the monument. You can't see those names inscribed there because of uh, all of the people standing in the way, but um, the, many of the, the, the original Confederate settlers' last names are inscribed in the base of the monument, okay? In the foreground of the photo, you can see men dressed in gray Confederate uniforms and women in the characteristic yellow bell hoop skirts. The men hold the state flags of the 13 Confederate States of America and um, are participating in a, a flag ceremony, presentation of the flags of the Confederate States, okay? In addition to ceremonies like these, the stage was filled throughout the day of the festival with Southern rock and roll and country music and renditions of the work of famed contemporary singers like Alison Krauss, Alan Jackson, and others who notably were not alive during the uh, antebellum pre-Civil War years, right? <laughs> uh, festival goers enjoy these events with beer and uh, Prato Confederado or a Confederate plate, as they call it. Uh, which integrates things like southern fried chicken and biscuits alongside some more traditional Brazilian dishes like farofa and vinagrete. Okay, uh, so there's sort of this hybrid cultural hybridization um, taking place at the same time as well. Okay, so 
So let's look a little bit at some of the historical background in some more detail. Um, as I mentioned previously, rather than face reconstruction, some eight to 10,000 Confederates migrated to Brazil, which importantly had yet to formally abolish slavery at the time of the end of the US Civil War in 1865. Okay, Brazil would, would not abolish slavery formally until 1888, so another 23 years. Um, and it would also be the last country in the Western Hemisphere to, to formally abolish slavery. Okay. Primary and secondary source documentation from the letters that Confederate migrants sent home to the states and census records indicate that the similarities between the US and Brazilian societies, especially in terms of their similar racial hierarchies and economic systems built on chattel slavery, at least in part shaped the desires of Confederates choosing Brazil as a migration destination. The work of historian Luciana Brito and political economist Silvio Antonio Alcantara Silva have made this case provocatively, uh, and yet much of their work has been published in Portuguese. So one of the things I wanted to do with my dissertation was to synthesize some of that and publish it in English. Okay. Um, yet sadly, historical accounts that have been written in English um, mostly memorialize rather than critically analyze this Confederate migration, largely excluding the role of racism in creating the conditions for and shaping the Confederate migration to Brazil. Uh, an important new book on this subject, pictured here, was just published earlier this month uh, by fellow geographer Dr. Alan Marcus. I've actually yet to get my hands on a copy of the book or read it yet, but um, if you're interested in uh, looking at some relatively new research published in geography on this subject, uh, that's a great place to go. I'm hoping to get my copy soon. Um, my research differs a little bit from Dr. Marcus's, though, in the sense that it, my work deals more explicitly with the politics of commemorating the Confederacy in Brazil today, rather than necessarily examining some of these social and environmental forces that shaped um, the, the migration historically. Um, although certainly that historical work has and continues to inform how I interpret the way that Confederate memory politics are unfolding on the ground in Brazil today. So I'd like to say a word about some of my, my, my two kind of key theoretical lenses that I'm using in my work. Um, first, let's examine a little bit about settler colonialism. Settler colonialism is different from other kinds of colonialism uh, in the sense that it seeks to replace or more directly ethnically cleanse or commit genocide against the original indigenous population of the colonized territory and repopulate it with a new society of settlers. Settlers often develop a collective place-based identity and attachment to the land that they colonize and control. Um, and they like to also control typically the history of that colonization to justify continued settlement, occupation, and colonization. So that's sort of the part where memory comes in, right? Examples of settler societies include places like the United States, Australia, Israel, Kenya, and Argentina, to name only a few. I argue following scholars like Richard Gott and Desiree Poets, amongst others, that Brazil should also be considered a settler colony, despite the fact that it's not really received a lot of attention in the scholarly liter literature as such, and is not often what comes to mind when we think about settler colonialism. Uh, there's a reason for this, which I won't go into now, I go into a little bit in my Journal of uh, Heritage Tourism piece. But um, in particular, I theorize that confederados can be considered what I call settlers twice over, right? Having settled or descended from settlers once in the US and then settling uh, once again, a second time in Brazil. Settler colonialism helps me make sense of the narrative presented at the Museum of the Immigration and, um, and, and also helps me understand this narrative of Confederate pioneers that emerges through the museum's exhibits and texts, okay? My other theoretical lens that I'm using here is uh, global critical race and racism or global critical race theory. Um, this is a framework that um, I'm citing based on uh, the work of Michelle Christian, who um, you know, I'm a little actually pretty partial to her work. She's on my dissertation committee at the University of Tennessee. She's a sociologist, doing some really, really great work. Um, but this framework of global critical race and racism theorizes race as a, a modern global project that takes shape differently in diverse structural and ideological forms across all geographies around the world, but is based 
in global white supremacy and shaped by the histories of transnational racialization processes. It theorizes racism as both a permanent phenomena and flexible in its expression across the globe. So racial categories are unevenly constructed and identification as white, for example, may mean different things in different places, but ultimately whiteness remains a deeply ingrained racist standard of desirability and social hierarchy, even as it becomes malleable across different spaces, places, and cultural and historical contexts. Okay? Taken together, settler colonialism and a global critical race and racism framework help me to make sense of how whiteness is constructed in particular and how ideas about it move and take shape from the US to Brazil. Uh, as well as how it continues to inform the unfolding global transnational political struggle uh, around Confederate commemoration. Okay, so uh, I'd like to highlight a little bit about my methods as well. Okay. Um, I'll start by explaining the method I used in my analysis of the Immigration Museum and then describe the methods I used uh, at the festival. Okay, at the museum, I adopted a qualitative methodology called spatial narrative analysis. This method builds on the insights of discourse analysis, which understands texts written on exhibit plaques as not the only texts, so to speak, that contribute to the overall narrative of a museum. For example, the selection of which artifacts to include or exclude and how they're positioned in, in the spatial arrangement of uh, exhibits matters to the overall narrative that's communicated, right? Some artifacts or exhibits are given prominence, whereas others are located more on the periphery, right? And so I'm arguing with spatial narrative analysis that um, the location of the arrangement of, and design of exhibits and museums say as much or sometimes more about the actual, uh, the narrative being communicated than the text being written on plaques, okay? Um, where visitors' attention is drawn and where ideas are located then says something about their importance and their prominence. I emphasize in particular the centrality and peripherality of exhibits and texts and look at whose histories and experiences are given center stage in the museum and whose are hidden, quite literally sometimes, in the shadows. Spatial narrative analysis helps me make sense of the museum's narrative through an analysis of its spatial design and the implications of that design for its message, okay? Let's see, sorry, I lost my place in my notes here. Okay, at the um, Confederate Festival, I took, like I said, a mixed methods approach involving um, interviews, ethnographic methods, participant observation, and archival field work. I explored the archives at a, um, a place called the Centro de Memoria, the Memory Center, uh, amongst some other places locally in, uh, in Americana, Santa Barbara do Oeste, and the surrounding area, including in a city called Piracicaba. Um, I interviewed Confederate descendants, festival organizers, uh, festival participants and tourists. And I also interviewed members of an organization called U Negro, which stands for the Union of Black People for Equality. It's like a civil rights uh, organization uh, that's it's, it's very prevalent throughout Brazil. But, you know, I, I focused on, you know, talking to some folks who were part of the local Americana chapter of U Negro and who were sort of organizing some protests around the use of Confederate iconography at the festival. Okay. Um, and I, I attended and observed the Confederate Festival in 2019 and lived and studied for an academic year between September 2018 and July 2019. Okay. Here are the primary questions that I'm asking with my work. Okay, this is what I, I want to know. First, how does the museum, the Confederate Museum, represent the history of Confederate migration? To what extent and where are racism and slavery being discussed in the museum's exhibits? Second, how does the Confederate festival commemorate the Confederate migration? How absent or present is the memory of slavery, especially at the festival? I wanted to know whether, how, and to what extent the connections between slavery and settler colonialism 
were being romanticized with respect to the way that confederados sort of interpret and commemorate um, their, their ancestors' migration to Brazil. And here's what I found. Okay. At the museum, I had three roughly major findings. First, as I alluded to previously, I found that the museum's overall narrative em emphasizes the artifacts and experiences of white Confederate settlers. No surprise given that the white Confederate settlers organized the museum and donated much of the artifacts um, that make up the museum's exhibits. A sewing wheel, for example, is featured prominently here in the exhibit space, as well as a Confederate woman's dress um, as sort of centrally located focal points in the main exhibit room. And like I said, this is perhaps to be expected given that the museum is curated by local Confederate descendants, including the manager actually, the manager of the museum is also a Confederate descendant. So the person who is sort of responsible for the curation and the, the entire commemoration and, and interpretive process at the museum is in fact a Confederate descendant herself, okay? Second, I found that the museum mentioned slavery only once and that the context in which it is mentioned obscures the centrality of enslavement um, and its central role that it played in the causes and consequences of not only the Civil War, but also the Confederate migration to Brazil. I'll say a little bit more about this in the next slide, okay? Third, the museum crafts an image of the Confederados as brave, bootstrapping, swashbuckling pioneers, striking out to make a new life with courage and valor upon their devastating defeat in the Civil War. In general, then, what I found is that the museum showcases what Confederados brought without discussing what brought them to Brazil. A desire to relocate to a place that as closely as possible resembled the defeated slaveocracy that they were fleeing. By the art educator's own admission, as you can see in the top quote there in this next slide, the museum presents a romanticized picture of life under slavery. The only mention of slavery that the museum uh, makes is on this plaque pictured on the right side of the slide where an enslaved man is pictured alongside some other Confederates. The caption as well only refers to this man as escravo, which translates literally to slave and does not discuss the role of slavery in broader terms of these early times as the type of the, the title there says os primeros tempos, which means the early times. So it mentions this person, uh, labels them as escravo or slave without discussing at all in the text or really in, in the museum, what the role of slavery might've been during that time uh, in shaping Brazilian society and shaping the foundation of these cities by Confederate settlers, okay? Even this lone mention of slavery itself is on a plaque marked in a dark corner of the museum that in my mind, spatially and ideologically, um, makes it marginal to the museum's overall narrative, marginalizes the what should be, in my view, sort of a, the centrality of slavery and shaping life at that pre-abolition moment. It's quite literally, in this sense, overshadowed by the content treating the activities and inner lives of the Confederate settlers. So to give you some perspective, if you look back at this slide I showed previously into the the photograph in the, the bottom right and look in the right side of that photograph, you can see it's sort of darker in that part of the image than the rest of the museum. It's not very well lit. In fact, much of this museum is lit exclusively by natural light. And so the windows are open and they're casting um, their shadow into uh, or, or shining their light into the museum exhibit. And the place that gets the least amount of light and the least amount of attention is in the, the overshadowed dark corner. That's where the one lone mention of slavery is. And uh, even that mention, like I said, it just labels this one person as escravo or slave without really actually discussing uh, the role of slavery in the pre-abolition Brazilian society, okay? Oh, um, two other texts here that I have yet to mention are worth exploring to drive this point home before moving on to talk a little bit about the festival, okay? The museum repeatedly describes the Confederate migrants as heeding their pioneer instincts. Okay, this is a direct quote from one of the plaques uh, in search of these new horizons. 
It also implicitly suggests that the lands the settlers occupied prior to arriving in Brazil were absent an indigenous presence. One exhibit says that all of Brazilian history, including this particular version of Brazilian history or the slice of Brazilian history, is a process of, quote, peopling a large territory that the 15th and 16th century European navigators found almost deserted upon arrival, end quote. This elimination fits with broader patterns of memory and claims to land in settler societies like Canada, the United States, and Palestine, Israel, that ignore or erase indigenous land use and occupancy and do not recognize it as legitimate prior to colonization by settlers. As Lloyd and Pulido have written, a key part of colonialism is memory and narration. In their words, the settler is plagued by the insecurity of a never quite legitimate possession. Erasing or downplaying indigenous presence on land works to legitimize the ongoing settler project and here makes the Confederate migration seem normal, inevitable, and natural, right? Yet at the same time, the museum also highlights the various nationalities and diverse backgrounds of those who migrated to and settled in Brazil during this, this time period, Italians, Portuguese, even Syrians, and those from elsewhere. The museum highlights the persecution that some of those groups faced in their home countries and discusses the wars and conflicts they fled. Yet the museum never discusses any ideologies of superiority or conflicts they might have brought with them to Brazil or instigated upon arrival, proffering instead a version or a vision of Brazil as a refuge from violence and conflict going on elsewhere. This fits with some of the major themes of the still popular racial democracy myth in Brazil, identified by social scientists as the idea that due to intense racial intermarriage and miscegenation over time, that there isn't any racism in Brazil anymore, right? Part of this racial democracy myth, um, and I'm citing especially the work of Francis Windance Twine from uh, 1997, uh, is that the racial democracy myth requires what she calls spatial containment as an important component, component of the mythology. Right, the idea that racism or bigotry or discrimination are always located over there somewhere, somewhere else, in a faraway land, uh, perhaps in an immigrant's home country, but never here, never close to home, never where we are, in this case, not in Brazil, okay? So um, now let's turn to a little bit about the, the festival, Confederate festival. Pictured here is the area of the festival where small Confederate trinkets and souvenirs are sold. Everything from mouse pads to miniature flags to temporary tattoos and clothing items and accessories. What I want you to notice about this image and many of the other images I'm gonna show you going forward about the festival is the rough demographic makeup of who attends the festival. You'll notice that most of the tourists at the festival are lighter skinned Brazilians. In fact, one festival goer that I interviewed who was one of very, very few young Afro-Brazilian women in, in attendance, mentioned this right away in her interview. It was the first thing that she noticed. She recounts her experience translated into, uh, into English by me this way. So the first thing I notice is that being Black, I always notice. I think it's automatic. We always do that. When you enter an event, you look, you think, dang, I'm the only Black person. When I entered, I saw a lot of white people. Then I thought, okay, I'm the only black person. Then I saw another black woman very far away, right back there in the corner. I thought, ah, there's one more. Then I saw another black woman. And the people who were working at the festival, the security guards, you know, many of them were black. But of the festival's participants, there were very few, very few black people. She says, I saw two women. So I felt a little tense upon entry just because of that. Okay. This participant documented her experience of feeling uh, what I describe as racial tension in the air or in the atmosphere, uh, given the overwhelmingly white makeup of the festival goer crowd. Pictured here again is another sh um, shot from the festival near the Confederate monument, which um, you can actually see some of the names this time engraved in the bottom of the monument, as well as the uh, classic uh, Confederate icon symbol there. Um, <clears throat> Let's see. 
Yeah, you, so you can see here, you know, folks are seated here in this area um, next to the stage. The stage is in the, the left side of the image and they're sort of in a shaded area with tables and chairs, kind of enjoying uh, the festival events, you know, having a beer, having some food, relaxing, um, mostly having a good time. But again, look at the demographic makeup. They're mostly, mostly lighter skinned Brazilians um, and not a lot of, you know, at least visibly Afro descendant people or black people, right? And this becomes so, somewhat of a, a problem to um, explain and describe from my perspective as the researcher, because I'm a, a white North American gringo who has been socialized into one particular kind of culture and one particular way of thinking about race. Uh, and that's different, that, that sort of comes out differently in Brazil. So sometimes people that um, like Afro descended Brazilians would say, you're, you're white talking, talking to someone in Brazil. And to me, they look, you know, Latina or Latino. And I wouldn't necessarily think of them as white, but um, at the same time, you know, there, there is this, this pretty obvious element that most of the people who attend the festival are not visibly, you know, darker skinned Afro descendants. Okay, so I just wanted to flag that sort of problematic um, issue there. Okay. I found the participants comment about the racialized nature of the demographics at the festival to ring true. Um, indeed, many of the security guards working the festival were darker skinned, especially in comparison to the festival's participants and tourists. This image shows two security guards next to a line of young men in Confederate uniforms just before they marched out onto the stage to display flags of the 13 states, uh, the 13 Confederate states. Okay. And that little uh, image back, the little structure back there is actually a chapel in which um, it was actually you know, the first Protestant chapel in Brazil, according to, uh, according to the Confederates, uh, because they were actually the first to bring Protestant Christianity to Brazil uh, in a mostly Catholic and, and also sort of mixed indigenous and Afro um, descended, you know, religious environment. Okay. Um, one other quote from a member of the Black movement is instructive here to help contextualize the sense of racial tension in the festival's atmosphere. A member of Unegro that had that participated in protests outside of the festival said the following, um, once again translated by me into English. Since we did not aim to enter or confront the space restricted to invited guests, we positioned ourselves peacefully yet inconveniently outside the paid restricted area. Uh, we were received even after having formed a discussion roundtable on the history of the Confederates and enslavement in Brazil with racist epithets and hostilities. So she's pointing out here the fact that in 2017, after the, Char the Charlottesville tragedy uh, in the United States, um, folks at, at, within uh, the black movement actually organized a public roundtable and discussion with the organizers of the festival to sort of talk about, okay, you know, you guys are using these Confederate symbols. Uh, this, these things are going on in the United States around the use of these symbols. Let's talk about the history of them. And so she's sort of flagging that we've already had this public uh, discussion in which, you know, very various folks mentioned to me that they thought the discussion was relatively productive. And so we thought we might have some sort of rapport, but even, even still, uh, after having had that public discussion, you know, a number of members of the Unegro group actually received racist epithets and hostilities from people who were entering the festival area. And this is the paid entrance area to the festival just outside where uh, the members of Unegro were uh, sort of occupying the space and registering their dissent around the use of Confederate symbols there. Okay. This participant remarked that despite having participated in a public debate with these festival organizers, they were received at the festival with racist epithets and hostilities. Some apparently shouted at them from passing cars prepared to enter the restricted paid entrance area. This certainly contributed to the creation of this uh, racial tension and, and heaviness in the atmosphere surrounding the festival. 
Unegro members <clears throat> responded with protest, drawing in, in some instances on traditional African cultural traditions like uh, you know, and, and instruments like, for example, the practice of capoeira, pictured here um, in, well, actually here in the, the next slide. Capoeira, for those who may not be familiar, is actually an Afro-Brazilian cultural tradition rooted in mixed martial arts and dance that emerged out of an effort to disguise swift kicks and forceful self-defense movements and tactics from their enslavers. It remains even to this day a powerful Afro-Brazilian cultural practice, and in this context serves as a way of resisting and reclaiming a place, hoisting symbols used by enslavers and with a long history of white supremacy and colonialism behind them. Capoeira too signifies, in my mind at least, the ways in which oppressed peoples often find creative ways to not just survive and reclaim a place, but also to thrive and find joy through, uh, through placemaking. You can even see you know, laughing expressions on the faces of those participating in some instances here in Capoeira. So as a geographer, uh, there's, you know, scholars of race and place in my field are, um, are uh, they often call this black geographies, right? This effort to sort of not only reclaim a sense of place, but to also, um, you know, survive, not just survive, but thrive and find joy and uh, expressions of joy in, in placemaking, creating these alternative spaces. So um, you might think of this as a moment where uh, folks were creating black geographies, okay, outside the festival. Okay. Finally, one more extended quote from a, an actually a Confederate descendant who participates as the lead singer of a Southern rock band in the festival is instructive for understanding this felt sense of racial tension in the atmosphere. So we've documented how members of the Unegro, how a, a festival participant who is an Afro-Brazilian woman have felt racial tension at the festival and experienced racism at the festival. Now we're gonna talk a little bit about even a Confederate descendant who is, uh, you know, to my knowledge, he didn't share any Afro-descended ancestry with me and is visibly much lighter skin and will probably even pass as white in the United States. Um, this is what he says about his participation in, uh, in the festival as a lead singer in the rock band. He says, there are contradictory feelings. The happiness I feel at the moment, because I know that this image, the Confederate symbol, it doesn't hurt me, but it hurts other people. So I already feel, I think, a discomfort, not for me, but I feel a discomfort when I use empathy to put myself in the shoes of those who suffer from that. So from time to time, despite the happiness of playing music for everyone on a large stage or with, and with a large audience, although everybody's having fun, there is this certain discomfort also. And in the cemetery part, I regret that my ancestors fought for wrong beliefs, defending the wrong side of history. Now, a huge flag painted on the stage where he plays music um, already complicates things a little, he says. But there's not a simple answer to your question. It's a mixture of feelings. There are moments that I'm happy, I'm satisfied with what I'm doing there at the festival, but there are moments of discomfort too. In my mind, this quote points to the fact that even some Confederate descendants recognize a certain internal conflictedness about their participation in a largely uncritical celebration of the slaveholding American Southern Republic's symbols and culture. Okay, and here's an image of one of several Southern rock bands that played on the uh, the large stage on the cemetery grounds for a little context, okay? And uh, just so you know, we're getting ready to wrap up. This is my last slide before the conclusion. So we're, we're coming around the corner, all right? Finally, the racial tension in the festival's atmosphere is, in my view, actively created by the festival organizers as well, okay? Organizers of the festival actually draped a poster over the edge of the wall at the entrance and exit to the festival that reminds visitors what the symbol really means. Quote, and I, put, I say that in air quotes because that's the title of it there. It says what it really means. You can see it's in Portuguese, a little bit larger. larger. It says, o que realmente significa. And then in English, underneath that, it says what it really means. Okay. This poster's text is written in both English and Portuguese, perhaps with the intent of communicating this message to the non-zero number of Confederate heritage enthusiasts who often travel long distances from the United States to participate in uh, this annual festival. 
The poster argues essentially that the symbol is really a depoliticized Christian symbol in which red represents the blood of Christ, white, the protection of God, and the blue X, uh, the St. Andrew's cross, signifying Jesus's first disciple. If the Confederate symbol is really just an ideologically neutral sort of family event, as festival organizers have repeated over and over in the news uh, when being interviewed in, in, in a way to kind of defend their practices at the festival, um, why strike such a, such a defensive tone? Why place this poster at the entrance and exit to the festival? Um, I argue that the poster is actually a reminder of who belongs and who does not belong within the space of the festival. And in its attempt to actually publicly avoid historical association of the symbol, uh, you know, with slavery, it actually implicitly draws attention back to that connection, rendering the memory of slavery an absent present one. On the one hand, strategically rejected and defensively dismissed, and on the other hand, palpably present in the festival's atmosphere of racial tension. By way of conclusion, I'd like to highlight what I hope are some of the broader impacts of this work. First, I hope to contribute to a broadened public perspective on the history and geography of Confederate memory, an issue typically thought to be contained to the US South or perhaps the US as a whole is actually a much wider reaching issue with global transnational implications. The Confederate flag, um, you know, it flies in Brazil as I've discussed here but it also flies in places like Ireland and Germany and other European countries and places around the world. I argue that we need more research to understand how Confederate iconography and ideology becomes embedded into local landscapes and cultures and fits into larger racialized colonial patterns of cultural globalization and shapes and, and also how it shapes and inflames existing social tensions and religious and racial conflicts. Um, on the ground uh, in different countries and different societies and different cultural historical contexts around the world. Relatedly, I hope to also develop a somewhat expanded understanding of the transnational dimensions of white supremacy and settler colonialism in museums and at festivals. Although the nation state has long been the primary sort of unit of analysis of understanding settler colonialism, what I hope to have shown is that in alignment with this global critical race and racism framework, Whiteness and white supremacy take place and come to matter and resonate across borders and across different scales and geographies. This research has implications as well for heritage tourism managers and planners, as well as museum managers, dealing with the transnational histories and memories of, of difficult heritage who wanna curate culturally sustainable, thoughtful, honest heritage content that transparently and critically engages with traumatic pasts and pasts of, uh, of in, you know, involving violence, especially racialized uh, and colonial violence. Okay, finally, I hope that my work challenges romanticized historical accounts of the Confederate migration that depict the Confederados as mere downtrodden, swashbuckling, bootstrapping pioneers in search of new lands and as subjects not implicated in maintaining and perpetuating systems of settler colonialism, slavery, and racist and colonial violence. I hope to contribute to research in Latin American and Africana studies and critical heritage and tourism and memory studies and to black geographies, um, to, to that work that's highlighting the contributions and memories of African descended and indigenous people in the Americas and the placemaking practices they employ to resist, survive and thrive in the face of racist repression and erasure. Um, one thing I didn't actually include here in my slideshow is that um, there's a really interesting story that I think brings home some of the importance of this work, um, which involves two Confederate settlers who, uh, after, upon, upon migrating to Brazil, actually um, lynched a police chief in the state of Sao Paulo because that police chief was faced with the decision of whether or not to actually use his department's resources to chase down and recapture escaped you know, recently formerly enslaved people. And when the police chief decided he did not want to do that, these Confederate settlers actually publicly lynched the police chief. And so what, what, you know, what you can actually, an argument I think you can actually make about the importance of understanding this, this context of transnational Confederate memory is that um, 
you know, in addition to bringing all of the things that the museum tells us that the Confederados brought, right? Like they brought Protestant Christianity, they brought the, the watermelon, you know, they brought, uh, they actually brought the tool of the plow, the agricultural technology of the plow to Brazil for the first time. The museum loves to celebrate these things that Confederados brought with them. But in some cases, the Confederados also brought the, uh, the practice of lynching with them as well. And, um, you know, acts of racial violence. So um, I hope that uh, you guys found that to be somewhat interesting and engaging. I hope that um, as well, you've gotten a chance to read some of my work here in, in Journal of Heritage Tourism. I know it's in your learning management system. Um, and as well, I already mentioned my other piece there in focus on geography. Um, I allow me to extend my gratitude to all of you guys, especially to Dr. Decker for, uh, for assigning my article for you to read, for reading it, for engaging with it, for inviting me to talk with you guys today. And uh, you can feel free to follow up with me if you'd like to at, at, um, at my email address here or on Twitter. I'm at JP Brasher as well. I'm happy to talk with you about any of your, your projects in this class or other wider things that you're thinking about and working on and to sort of think together on some of these issues around monuments, memory, commemoration. Uh, you know, especially for me, it's kind of the interesting part is the transnational context, but we can talk about it in any scale and context um, if you guys want to follow up. So thank you so much. That concludes uh, what I had prepared to talk with you guys about today formally. Okay. Well, that's incredible. Thank you, Dr. Brasher. And we have about 10 minutes left. It's 12.04. So we have about 10 minutes left for some questions and some thoughts. So let's give Dr. Brasher a couple seconds to kind of gather his thoughts and everything. Um, and what we can do is I don't see any questions in the chat right now. So what we can do is we can just, um, I can just call on you all if you use the raise hand feature, that would work. Um, and then you can just ask your question of Dr. Brasher. It can be about what he presented uh, this morning to us um, and shared. It can be about the images that you saw. It can be about his article or the extra, the URL that was the additional item um, in my courses. So does anybody want to start us off? Okay, it looks like Chris has a question. Chris, go for it. Uh Hi, uh, I was just wondering if you did any like research into like the, I know there was like a plan for the Confederates to take over, at least make a lot of Latin America kind of like almost uh, colonies of themselves uh, if they had succeeded or not. And I, I just wondered if there was any uh, influence in places like Mexico, because I know it was like when uh, France invaded Mexico during the Civil War or whatever that there was some sort of, uh, you know, they wanted to make a deal with the, the then the French appointed emperor of Mexico or not. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah, thank you for your question, Christopher. Um, I really appreciate that. Um, you know, there, there actually is a really interesting book that just came out this month. Not to be, I don't know, didn't really mean to be promoting all these people's books, but there, there's so many, there's some great work coming out about this. There's a new book by an historian named Kevin Waite that's called West of Slavery in which um, he sort of makes the argument that, you know, exactly what you mentioned, Christopher, a lot of the, uh, the folks who were involved in the upward leadership of the Confederate States of America were really envisioning how to create an alternative Confederacy somewhere, if, if in fact the Confederacy failed, and, and it did mostly fail, right, in the Civil War. Uh, and so that book focuses a little bit more on the efforts of Confederates to expand West in the United States, it doesn't focus as much on any effort to uh, sort of expand into Latin America. Um, although I will say, at least from what I've read and from my research, it looks like any efforts to do that were mostly failed by the Confederates because um, as far as I can tell, the only place that really retains much of a, a legacy or a lineage or sort of traces of the Confederate settlement on the landscape today is you know, my study site, Americana Santa Barbara do Oeste in Sao Paulo State. I mentioned that they did migrate to a lot of other places, but they typically faced too much hardship and disease to really create any permanent colonies or settlements there. You know, places like Mexico, Honduras, Chile that I mentioned before, Venezuela, 
um, you know, they migrated there and then they were, they often, you know, they either befell, um, befell, they, they came sick with a, a disease and they perhaps died or they had to move to find medical care somewhere. And in many, many cases, they actually befell such difficult economic hardship that they ended up migrating back to the United States uh, or to, or elsewhere in Latin America. So, so the, that permanent influence of the settler or the, the Confederate settler society really only lasted as far as I can tell in, in Brazil and in, in Sao Paulo state where I did my work. That's a great question, Chris. Thank you for that. Other questions from um, those of you in class. Any, any other questions you have for Dr. Brasher? Looks like Veronica has a question and then we'll do CODA. So Veronica and then CODA. Um, I know like in the reading you mentioned it, but did you have any difficulties like translating the Portuguese to English without like losing any of the meaning? Mm. Yeah, that's a great question. Um, so yeah, you can never really capture the full sort of context of, oh, sorry, I was just hearing some. Is she talking again still or? Nope, I think we're good. Maybe it's my, must be my Zoom is messing up. Because <laughs> um, I'm, I'm like hearing spurts of voices that it's nonsensical, but it keeps like crackling over the speakers. Sorry. Um, yeah, so you can never really capture the full contextual sort of meaning when you translate from one language to another, right? Languages themselves are in many ways sort of their own like epistemologies, their own way of understanding and viewing the world. And so inevitably some things get lost in translation. Um, one example of this that comes to mind is actually in the, uh, the debate between the festival organizers and the members of the black movement in 2017 over the use of Confederate iconography at the festival. Um, really, it brought out some themes around Confederate iconography that I never really expected. And it was interesting to see the ways that language and specific sort of political cultural context in Brazil sort of were threaded into the debate. Um, I remember, you know, at the time, so in 2017, it was sort of a somewhat different political moment in Brazil than it is now, in the sense that there had just been, you know, this big corruption scandal with the left-wing president Lula had been convicted on, you know, um, issues of money laundering. And, and so everybody's thinking and talking about corruption. And so in ways that even, even the most diehard Confederate enthusiasts in the U.S. would not associate necessarily with Confederate history, there were these threads of association with, with corruption, right? I remember one of the, the festival organizers said something like, you know, um, one of the reasons that the Civil War was being fought was that they didn't, they, they saw corruption in the federal government. And so the, the Confederate states wanted to secede because of the corruption in the federal government. And that might seem on its face to not really make a lot of sense or resonate. But if you're living in Brazil in a cultural context with this large left wing corruption scandal, right, the way that that language and, and cultural and political context influences the way that people think about Confederate iconography is really, really fascinating for me, at least. I don't know if that answers your question, but um, I, I don't feel like I necessarily had trouble with translating, but at the same time, it, it is sometimes difficult and in my mind, kind of impossible to really fully capture the meaning in one language from, from one language to another. My thought. I think Coda had a question. So Coda, did you have a question? Uh, yes, my I have like two questions, but one I'll just send you a follow up email because it gets a lot more like in depth than the like five minutes left of class we have. Okay. Um, but I was wondering if you have turned your research into a book. Oh, yeah, good question. No, I haven't yet. Um, I'm still working on getting out some more articles based on the research. And I was hoping that once I got the articles out, then I could sort of reconvene and try to recraft it into a book form. Because the way I wrote my dissertation was not in a traditional book length manuscript style. It was what some people call a three article dissertation where you write sort of standalone publishable journal articles and then put them all together and write like an intro and conclusion that tie them together. So my dissertation is actually really a series of articles rather than sort of a intro literature review methods type of you know book co comprehensive holistic book manuscript. So it would take a little bit of reworking to make it into a book, but I'm interested. 
I'm interested in doing so. I think that was a great question too. Thank you for asking that, Coda, because it, it discloses some of the differentiations among all of our disciplines. So um, I'm in a history department and my PhD is actually in art history. Mm. And th that is very much like, well, I wrote mine rather non-traditionally, like I had all these chapters going all at the same time, but but it is very formulaic. It's kind of the introduction, the, the lit review, the sort of research mm -hmm. problem, and then the interrogation at the site, and then what you do in the end. And we rarely do the article first. It's kind of like get the big mm -hmm. thing going. And, and so it's just interesting. So those of you, um, and for context, Dr. Brasher, this class is a gen ed course that's writing intensive. And so students oh. come from at least seven different okay. colleges in our class. So we have students from a wa wide awesome. range of disciplines represented. So for their disciplines, um, and we're all undergraduates for their disciplines, that that framing would be entirely different too. So um, I think we have okay. time, 12, 13. I think we have time for maybe one more question. Does anyone have a question to ask Dr. Brasher? And it's okay, he'll stop talking at 12.15, so you can still, you know. I'll ask one, but if a hand raises, we can defer to the hand. Um, how did you come upon this top, this specific topic? I mean, for your dissertation? I mean, it's, it's very, um, it may not be something, maybe it's something you encountered in undergrad or graduate school, but how did you come up on the topic? Yeah. Yeah, one day I was uh, sitting in my graduate assistant office at Oklahoma State University when I was working on my master's degree there. And uh, one of my fellow grad students came in and he used to call, he used to call me Jordy. It was his nickname for me. He says, Jordy, I'm reading this incredible book. It's so fascinating. And did you know that the Confederates went to uh, went to Brazil after the Civil War, and they, I said, "What book are you reading?" He said, "I'm reading a book called 1493, which is about sort of the you know the history of the Americas post colonial contact, European contact." And um, I had not I had not heard of the the issue of the Confederados before that point, so I, I did some thinking about it. I thought, eh, it's an interesting story," but I never imagined it would play so centrally in like my academic and professional life. A couple of years later, I, you know, I end up at University of Tennessee doing my PhD and uh, we're writing a, a grant where well, I'm taking a grant writing class for as part of my coursework for the PhD. And, um, you know, all of us have to write and submit a grant as part of the coursework. So uh, I came across an interesting grant that um, challenged me to sort of think outside the box. And, and, and I sort of took the opportunity to think, OK, you know, if I had the chance to get an Internet, a grant to do international field work, study abroad, long term intensive language learning, what would I do? What would I want to do? And I came back to that moment where I learned about the Confederados and I thought, you know, this seems really interesting. It was also I was taking that class in uh, I believe it was 2018. So it was not too much after the Charlottesville incident had happened. So it was really in the forefront of everybody's mind. I, and and I, I ended up getting a, a grant to go to live abroad and do this work that was focused around U.S. national security. And I sort of made the case that Charlottesville really showed us that uh, national security in the United States is as much an internal as an external issue. And that traditionally, even though we thought about national security as something where external threats are approaching the U.S., you know, we have a, a major white supremacy issue that is a, a huge national security threat. And I got the grant based on that argument. Wow, wow. Thank you for sharing that. Well, thank you so much, Dr. Brasher. If you wouldn't mind students, just put one a reaction of some kind of positive or, or whatever your reaction might be to share with Dr. Brasher. And thank you so much. Um, and thank you all for being here today and having some really good questions. If you do want to follow up with Dr. Brasher, I'll be sure to post his contact details in the my courses along with the color me calm things. Um, and thank you all so much. And I'll stick around on on zoom for us a couple minutes after class in case anyone has questions about things I went over. But thank you so much, Dr. Brash. I really appreciated it. And thank you, Coda, for getting all of our resources ready for today and for continued study. Those are all on um, my courses. Um, Coda pulled all the 39 different articles in case people are more interested in this topic. So you have access to all of that. And thank you wow. all. And I will see you next week. Bye, friends. Take care. Awesome. Thank you guys so much. I also posted a link there in the chat to my, my website. Um, if you want to read more of my research or check out some of the other things I'm working on, uh, teaching, things like that, you can check it out on my website too. Perfect. Thank you so much, Jordan. Thank that you. Was really fantastic. I really appreciated your time and we'll stay in touch. Okay. <laughs> okay. Yeah, absolutely.
I've really enjoyed being with you guys today. I wish we had, you know, more time for more discussion, but um, we'll work it out. We'll, we'll have you, we'll have you visit again uh, probably okay. on Zoom for the short term and maybe hopefully one day in person. So thanks so much, friend. We'll see you later. Thank you. All right. Thanks. Bye-bye. Thank you. Bye-bye. Okay, let's see. Oh, can I actually ask you something before you hop off? Yeah, let me, I'm going to stop the recording though. Let me, <laughs> my okay. students know I can't multitask. Like literally I cannot. Okay, stopping.